a pharmacist and then I'm going to talk about um, combined hormonal contraception base mostly because I think that's something you probably have people asking more about so these are my disclaimers um, so this is the agenda that I'm going to follow tonight we'll talk about diagnosing the menopause symptom control problematic bleeding um, is always a difficult thing to manage well and then benefits and risks and specifically in that order so when we think about diagnosis really this is based on the history so i think in pharmacy you're in a very good position to make a diagnosis i think listening is the most important skill um many women in the transition the menopausal transition which is any time from 45 onwards for most women will ex potentially experience heavy menstrual bleeding or certainly an alteration in their bleeding pattern in addition to common menopausal symptoms and we'll cover those in some of the slides to come so we had um, many years with no research no education and then in 2015 the NICE guideline, which was really helpful because it made some really important points. Number one, there is no point in measuring um, an FSH level in women who are symptomatic over the age of 45. Unfortunately, really, that information doesn't appear to have filtered through. I get patients all the time who've been told they're not menopausal because their FSH is normal, but your FSH is a snapshot in time. So it's a waste of time, really. Um, and it's a, a much better idea to provide women with a therapeutic trial of HRT if they're symptomatic. I, I also get women um, started on antidepressants frequently who are describing classical menopausal symptoms. They're not depressed and antidepressants are not a first line treatment. They might be helpful in women who are not suitable for hormone replacement therapy, but first line management in eligible women is to replace the deficient hormone. That's just a link to... Um, uh, a media interview that I did about blood tests and whether they was help to manage the menopause so you might want to have a look at that um, I wrote this booklet for patients it's quite um, high level patient information um, it's still good quality information despite the recent studies which we'll cover towards the end of the presentation uh, and I think it'd be really useful for GPs and also useful for pharmacists there are parts of that booklet where women can write down their own symptoms and um, the treatments they've been provided with the response to treatment that they've seen um, and we are in the process of making that available electronically so that an original booklet was um, designed um, partly with the help of unrestricted educational grants from Besans and Mylan and the updated electronic version is supported by Theramex which is a drug company um, providing a whole range of, of, of women's health products. So the other thing which I have been thinking about is a basic menopause package for GPs to provide sensible menopause care um, and I think that would be equally suitable for pharmacists. There is something called a special skills module that the Faculty of Sexual and Reproduct Reproductive Health Support and also the BMS have developed um, educational modules but they're probably too much for your average GP and actually when you think about it you know women lead a third of their right life post-menopause and they need uh, to be able to consider appropriate treatment I'm not saying for a minute that all women should have HRT but at least they need to be given the right information and I think that could be done an awful lot better so um I like to think of the common vasomotor symptoms, uh, sleep disturbance, hot flushes, night sweats as the evil twins. They make women's lives intolerable and not just for women, for their partners um, also. And what happens in the perimenopause is that many women are symptomatic in association with high levels. So the levels of estrogen are actually very variable. They can have high levels of estrogen um, and that can cause heavy menstrual bleeding because estrogen makes the lining of the womb thicken and then it sheds chaotically and that can also cause breast tenderness so it's a little bit like um, menarche when hormone levels are all over the place and, and, and 
women do not respond particularly well to that. So we think about hot flushes, 70% of women are still having hot flushes after seven years. So women who are being told it's a phase, it's a stage of life, it'll, you'll you know, get through it. That's not really fair. I mean, seven years is a hell of a long time to feel rubbish. Um, and some of the feelings of doom have been rated as being similar to experiencing chronic kidney disease. Um, we also know that severe flushes start early and they last a long time and they are a marker for cardiovascular disease. So I feel like the menopause consultation offers an awful lot more than providing women with HRT. Actually, we can significantly reduce once we've identified cardiovascular risk factors. Um, and that has the potential to provide better quality of life. Um, so basically, um, flushes are a marker for cardiovascular disease because they signify endothelial reactivity. In addition to declining oestrogen levels um, or variable oestrogen levels and then declining oestrogen levels, women also experience a reduction in testosterone from about the age of um, 20 onwards. So by, by, the, by the menopause, there's about a 40% reduction in sexual desire in menopausal women and that impacts on good health, good, you know, good sex, good health in a sort of biopsychosexual model. Uh, I don't think many people think about testosterone as a female hormone, but actually it's a very important female hormone and female ovaries produce more testosterone than estrogen. Uh, and it's important for drive generally, sex drive, it's good for brain fog, um, aching joints. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's got a real role to improve productivity and, and quality of life. So if we turn now to treatment, uh, a very simple way of looking at this is you would replace what the patient is deficient in. So, you know, if your patient had an underactive thyroid, there would be no angst about replacing that deficient hormone. And it's kind of illogical that we beat ourselves up a little bit about providing women with, with HRT. So ovaries are pre-programmed to last about 50 years. And fortunately, we've massively out outlived um, our ovaries but we're lucky enough that we have access to body identical synthetically made hormones but hormones that can replace what women are deficient in so just to reiterate what I said before antidepressants are not first-line therapy for menopausal symptoms um, as I also said before, it's not just about HRT. We need to think about the whole person. So it may be appropriate to provide cognitive behavioral therapy in addition perhaps to HRT or as an alternative to HRT to alleviate low mood, which is a very common menopausal symptom. And I have a special interest in urogenital atrophy, partly because it's under-recognized, under-treated, affects 80 up to 80% of menopausal women. And unlike the vasomotor symptoms, which for most women are transient, even although that may be um, that may take a long time to occur. Uh, urogenital atrophy is a chronic and progressive condition, which without treatment will get worse and worse and worse. And it's very, very easy to treat, and it's very easy to treat safely with vaginal estrogens for most women. But there are other choices, and again, you know, we'll cover that a little bit later on in the presentation. So I'm going to talk about the two hormones that are in most HRT pre preparations. We've got estrogen and progestogen. Progesterone is a naturally occurring hormone. Progestogens are synthetic and all of those come under the umbrella of progestins. So estrogen, um, we have the option of oral treatment and that might be with estradiol, one milligram, two milligram tablets. I think it's only fair to say that anything that is taken orally that goes through the gastrointestinal tract doesn't always get to the systemic circulation so there's been a there's between 10 and 40 percent absorption of medication taken orally but our patient population are familiar with oral administration you know they're used to taking things like paracetamol food uh, things go in their mouths and they're happy with that but it's not necessarily the safest way to deliver hrt it might be the least expensive but it is associated with an increase in the risk of venous thromboembolism, which, if it occurs, is associated with 
uh, not insignificant costs. Um, so, you know, with the shortages recently, I had a correspondence from a GP saying a patient who was on transdermal oestrogen but couldn't access her preparation was changed to oral treatment and she had a subclavian artery thrombosis. Now on clopidogrel, what was he going to do? Well, you can put her back on transdermal. She's on clopidogrel. It's not uh, going to be a problem. And we know that transdermal therapy doesn't increase the risk of VTE over and above the individual's inherent risk factors. So if she's overweight, uh, she has a strong family history of VTE. These are very significant factors, but it doesn't mean she can't have HRT. So women with risk factors for VTE can have HRT, but it should be delivered transdermally. And I was on a, a meeting with King, uh, clinicians from King's last week, professor of haematology saying women do not need thrombophilia screening. They just need transdermal therapy. So that makes life an awful lot easier for us. Um, so moving on to transdermal therapy, there are choices here. We have patches, we have gels, we now have a spray Lenzetto, which I have just had put on formulary at Liverpool Women's Hospital. Um, all of our new drugs need to go through Pan Mersey Drug and Therapeutics um, Area Prescribing Committee and uh, meetings are delayed because of COVID, but actually I had submitted lots of applications about new medications, which were all kind of stuck there. So our pharmacy has been really good about allowing access to some of the newer preparations, many of which are actually cheaper and safer. Lenzetto being a, a prime example of that. Um, if you consider women using estrogel might need up to six pumps, that's out of product license, that provides 4.5 milligrams of estradiol, then actually you can provide that in a much cleaner way by using a spray and it's within the product license. But at the moment, you're going to have to wait for that to go through Pan Mersey. So if we think about the pros, anything transdermal avoids first pass liver uh, metabolism. It results in a steady absorption over 24 hours. And if you have steady absorption, um, more stable systemic levels, then symptom control is often better. It reduces triglycerides, um, clotting factors are unaffected. Um, and tri uh, transdermal therapy is recommended for women who have any really significant medical problems. And actually the most significant of those is obesity because that comes with a risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, but also thinking about women who have problems with absorption, um, epilepsy, gallstones, migraine, problems with lipid profile, and then cons, well, transdermal Treatments are not always well absorbed and that depends on the skin type of the patient, whether she uses moisturisers that might form a barrier, even fake tan potentially, and it's commonly used in Liverpool, can cause um, a barrier. Um, it, so it is an issue for women who like to use other skin products. They can't do that uh, for, for at least an hour following application and definitely not before. I'm not a big patch fan. I think some people like them, some people don't. I will sometimes use them if women are on high doses of gels because that's just really messy, but uh, they do come off and so that's a problem. Um, I think the thing with patches, if you're applying your patch twice a week and the week's seven days long, doesn't divide into two, that causes confusion, but each patch provides four days cover um, some women just don't remember to change their patch remember their menopausal and they might be having problems with their memory so that's kind of um forgivable um regimes can get complicated if you're using a separate progestogen and with combination patches there is really only one choice and that's Everil conti so you don't have that flexibility with the dosage so moving on to implants, um, big problems with implants over the years, Organon used to make implants, then they stopped and there were real problems accessing implants. We now have access to compounded implants from Smartways. They're all we've got. Uh, they don't undergo the same rigorous tests as other drugs that we might prescribe, but they do work. Um, so I've only moved to Liverpool Women's recently in April. 
they had a very busy implant service, which was discontinued for a variety of reasons, but part of it was the availability of implants, but we've reestablished that. And implants are not first line therapy, but they have a place for women who are otherwise difficult to manage. So you may come across some of these women. Um, they will possibly have tried high dose um, patches, gels in the past. Um, if a woman is on a reasonable dose of estrogen and is not responding, I will do an estradiol level. I don't, I don't do lots of bloods because I would like to think um, that it, that doing a test will influence my patient's care. However, I have had patients using gel who, despite high levels, remain symptomatic. And when levels have been done, um, estradiol levels have actually been quite high, yet the patient is symptomatic. And that's very similar to what you see with tachyphylaxis with implants. So women have high levels of estrogen, but they, but they are symptomatic. And with implants, that's difficult to manage because implants take a long time to dissolve. And once they're in, you can't get them back out. But with gel... It's relatively easy. They just stop the gel until their levels fall. So for in, for women using implants, we um, do at least 12 monthly estradiol levels to ensure that we're not reinserting an implant in a woman who has an estradiol level of greater than 500 picomoles per liter. I mean, that's not set in stone. Obviously, if a woman's level was 550, I wouldn't say you're not having your implant. Um, we do also use testosterone implants, um, and, and they are converted to estradiol prior to excretion. So all of these sex steroid hormones are metabolized down a common pathway. They're not um, scary or uh, dangerous, particularly as long as some basic health checks are undertaken before um, women are prescribed. So I would always check somebody's BMI, their blood pressure before putting a, an implant in. I just think it's worth you knowing about Liverpool Women's Implant Service because there aren't many implant services available throughout the country. So if we now move to progestogens, um, obviously you have naturally occurring progesterone and then we have synthetic progestogens which are either derived from progesterone and are better tolerated or they're derived from 19 nor testosterone and that's you know a, a lot of the progestogens that we commonly use. Um, and some of those might have androgenic effects, but actually that can be beneficial. We think that progestogens, which are derived from progesterone, are better tolerated and less likely to be associated with side effects such as venous thromboembolism and breast cancer. But actually the evidence is not quite there yet. However, if you've got somebody who's having side effects, who's using levonorgestrel, then it would be logical to change to a product with, say, didrogesterone, which is very similar um, in its structure to naturally occurring progesterone. And on this next side, slide, you can see um, that similar activity with, with didrogesterone and naturally occurring progestogen, progesterone. Sorry. All right, now I think we'll look at different regimes. And I think we need to really simplify this because it causes a lot of confusion. So sequential preparations will induce a regular withdrawal bleed and they're normally commenced in women who are still having periods usually periods that are irregular but still bleeding uh, and it's difficult to initiate continuous combined hrt and have an acceptable bleeding pattern in those women so there are different regimes there are short um and long regimes. And the long regimes provide women with up to 70 days of estrogen only, and a, then a variable um, length during which a progestogen is added. Uh, so for example, you may have seen Tridestra, it's a commercially available preparation with 70 days of estrogen only, the addition of medroxyprogesterone acetate for 14 days, I think, and then seven days of placebo. Um, what that does is it may reduce side effects associated with the progestogen, but when the bleed comes after 70 days, it's often pretty horrible. Um, and then we get women who are on a sequential preparation who you would expect to bleed when they withdraw the progestogen, but they don't. Well, actually, you know what? That's nothing to worry about. That just means that the estrogen 
alone part hasn't caused any significant proliferation of the endometrium and you can leave them on that regime. Um, the recommendation is to leave women till they're about 54 or about five years. But again, that's not set in stone and then transfer them to a continuous preparation because women on continuous preparations have better endometrial protection. However, caveat, what you'll see later on is that those women might have a, a higher incidence of um, breast cancer. So managing the menopause, providing HRT is all about balancing benefits and risks. Somebody asked me today for PGDs for HRT. I don't think that this is an area which is um, suitable for PGD management because there are far too many variables. Um, we've drawn up some really simple pathways for Liverpool women's, which I think Dan's probably shared with you. Um, and I think pathways are probably a better way forward. So from what I've said already about um, moving to continuous combined HRT, there is an element of flexibility. If a woman is 12 months from her last menstrual period, then yes, start her on a continuous combined preparation. If we use low dose, hormonal therapy then the chances of women bleeding are reduced and as I've kind of alluded to at the beginning bleeding on HRT is a problem so anything we can do to reduce that is definitely something to be celebrated potentially um, the problem with using low dose is it doesn't always manage symptoms uh, I also think that when women are very symptomatic and you treat them and they get better they feel amazing and that just wears off and you know it doesn't stay with them and they don't remember how awful they felt so I think we just need to be careful about whacking up the dose in, in women who are probably better managed with a slightly lower dose um, we do know that women on continuous combined HRT have a very low incidence of hyperplasia. It's less than 1%. And in one, in one study that I looked at, there was no cancer. Um, because basically, progestogens inhibit estrogen-induced endometrial proliferation. Pr proliferation. That's what estrogen does to the endometrium. And the commonest causes of bleeding in women taking continuous combined HRT are endometrial polyps. They're really, really common. Atrophic um, endometri an atrophic endometrium or atrophic uh, urogenital tissue can cause bleeding. And women may just have a secretory endometrium in association with the use of progestogen. So that can also cause bleeding. There's also an alteration in angiogenesis, and that's a key feature in women who experience bleeding uh, whilst using continuous combined HRT. So just in a little bit more detail, bleeding in women who are on HRT is currently managed like postmenopausal bleeding in most units. Um, we worry about missing endometrial cancer and basically for women who are bleeding postmenopause, that should be um, excluded but in women who are on hormonal therapy particularly continuous hormonal therapy we know that actually that risk is reduced um, and I think really actually we should be looking at developing services specifically for women who are bleeding on HRT because actually up to 40% of women will have annoying bleeding um, and that's just related to them and also the specific estrogen and progestogen that they may be using in the route of delivery. And it doesn't necessarily need to be man managed on a cancer pathway. We're probably massively over investigating women, but it's always very difficult to change. Uh, so I would say that's something that I would be looking at changing, take a few years probably. So when you have somebody who's been on HRT and presents with bleeding, how long have they been on it? If it's in the first three to six months, I wouldn't be worried. I think that's normal. Um, I had a patient recently come to see me on Everell Conti complaining of a black discharge. Um, she actually had Crohn's and she'd had an ileostomy. So oral therapy for her wasn't ideal. Um, and I changed her to... Sandrina, so transdermal gel, 
with eutrogestan, which is micronized progesterone, body identical hormones. Those are body identical. They're not bio identical, but body identical. Um, however, I advised her to use the eutrogestan 100 milligrams vaginally out of product license and that causes huge amounts of anxiety because the 100 milligram capsule is not licensed for vaginal delivery but it's perfectly suitable uh, in fact i think it's better delivered vaginally the vagina has a fantastic blood supply hormone therapy is very well absorbed through the vaginal mucosa uh, and there are far fewer side effects with vaginal delivery because it's absorbed straight into the systemic circulation it doesn't have to go through the gastrointestinal tract um, and in order to control that woman's bleeding i would be prepared to reduce the dose of both hormones to perhaps reduce the dose of sandrina to 0 0.5 milligrams to use the eutrogestan alternate days but that's a work in progress um she currently is unhappy with the discharge from the eutrogestan delivered vaginally causes a bit of a white discharge of course it's very variable in different women what they experience she didn't have menopausal symptoms at presentation she had urogenital atrophy and osteoporosis um, and we will talk a little bit about different treatments for urogenital atrophy they include just briefly moisturizers, lubricants, vaginal estrogen as tablets, cream, gel, uh, waxy pessaries. Um, we also now have the option of DHEA. Again, that's stuck with Pan Mersey Area Prescribing Committee, but we do have access to that at Liverpool Women's and also Ospemaphine, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator taken orally for vaginal atrophy. And that's a, a useful option. So we've kind of covered some of this already. Is it better to have a, a different route to investigate women who have bleeding on HRT? I think a, a service whereby we can see them reasonably quickly to reassure them to do an ultrasound scan, but they don't necessarily need um, an outpatient hysteroscopy or even an inpatient hysteroscopy, but most women now are provided with hysteroscopies, hysteroscopy on an outpatient basis. Um, and just to kind of summarize what I said, uh, less than 1% endometrial hyperplasia in clinical trials, no cancers, um, and common causes of bleeding are polyps, atrophic changes in secretory endometrium. And the problem is basically that there are no guidelines. So it'll occur in 40% of women using continuous combined HRT. And sometimes we have to stop HRT for a short period of time in order for that um, to resolve. Um, so it's a complicated issue. It could be caused by um, issues with angiogenesis, vascular dysfunction, vessel breakdown. There are other things like uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, pericytes, leukocytes, metalloproteinase. As you can see how it's very complicated, but basically progestogens cause abnormal vessels. And that's very similar to what we see with progestogen only contraception. And I'm sure you've seen women on desigestral pills who come in complaining of continual bleeding and it drives them absolutely round the bend. So I've just mentioned ospemaphine, which is a serum. But for a woman with problematic bleeding, I think it's frustrating. There's a product called Juaviv, which has really sort of dropped off the market, but that had basidoxaphine, which is also a serum instead of a progestogen in combination with conjugated equine estrogens. Um, um, you know, I think for a small number of women who are either sensitive to progestogens or experiencing bleeding, that was a really important choice and it's just not widely available any longer. So that is um, that is a frustration. Um, women who have premenstrual disorders are often sensitive to the progestogen part in HRT. And in those women, um, sometimes Mirena is okay because most of the hormone is within the endometrial cavity. A small amount is absorbed into the systemic circulation, but it can be a way of reducing progestogenic side effects. Um, an alternative to that is to use a long cycle uh, 
a sequential regime like what you get in Tridestra, but I kind of make up my own usually with 70 days of transdermal estrogen and seven to 10 days of utrogestan delivered vaginally usually and I don't have any kind of hormone free interval I really can't understand why um, that would be appropriate so just to remember that lack of estrogen even if you replace the hormone uh, the urogenital tissues can be very sensitive to low levels or to variable levels resulting in urogenital atrophy which can cause um bleeding and as i said there are various treatments for that but the logical thing is to provide vaginal estrogen and most women are eligible for that if you use vagifem 10 micrograms daily um for two weeks and then twice a week for a year it's the equivalent of one single hrt tablet so you know the, the actual absorption is very very low and i think there are plans to make vagifem available over the counter Testosterone is, as I said, a very important female hormone. So women who present with menopausal symptoms, if we go back to those uh, diagrams at the beginning, I always ask about um, sex drive and also about vaginal dryness, pain, pain during sex. Um, we always initiate estrogen before we would add in testosterone. So I would provide some sort of regime. And I have a very, very small formulary uh, I don't tend to use everything in that's in the BNF and I'm probably talking about all the things I use I use lots of gel I use the spray I use micronized progesterone I use other progestogens if appropriate I sometimes use um, combination patches depends on the patient um, and if you're going to use testosterone it's important that the woman is given transdermal estrogen because that doesn't impact on sex hormone binding globulin oral therapy does so if you increase sex hormone binding globulin then that will it's like a sponge mop up the woman's testosterone and she's still getting some from her adrenal glands but that will not be beneficial for sex drive so in the nice guideline there is support to use testosterone. The problem is that there are no licensed products for women on the NHS. There is Androfem, which is available privately and it is available in this country. I had a message from a GP on Monday saying Androfem was only available in Australia. That's not true. Um, you can order Androfem and it's only available on a private prescription. It's expensive. So we use things like Testagel or Tostran, with the recommendation that women use a very small baked bean sized blob, I usually say apply it to the palmar aspect of the forearm because there's less likelihood of excess hair growth there. Um, my, my preference would be Tostran 2% in a pump dispenser. At Liverpool Women's, we only have Testagel, 50 milligrams in a 5 gram sachet, and a 5 gram sachet should last a woman about 10 days. Um, so that's that's that works well for most women um and then livial now livial should be prescribed by brand it's a complicated progestogen and if you prescribe that generically or if you dispense that generically then we can never be 100 percent sure that the woman is getting the same product every time it's very very low dose it results in a very small increase in um or small um, alteration in lipid profile so if somebody has high blood pressure wouldn't necessarily want to use Livial um, I do like it because I think it's good for bleeding control I think there is that potential beneficial effect associated with the androgen um, so it has it has definitely got a place they could have done with a higher dose uh, so out of product license I sometimes use two and that's perfectly all right as long as the woman has no um contraindications so we're going to just look here now at poor symptom control and side effects um, and if you've prescribed an adequate or if i've prescribed an adequate dose of estrogen and the patient remains symptomatic then those are the situations in which i would measure an estradiol level i've seen patients who have um, remained symptomatic who have normal estradiol levels and there isn't a set level but basically i would be going i would be aiming at about three to four hundred picomoles per liter um, and they still have low mood and and those are women who have additional problems they have um, 
often a little bit of depression which might have crept in anxiety is a very common menopausal symptom but you know it's very difficult to shake off sometimes um, and, and lack of sleep or disrupted sleep pattern is also a common problem in the menopause transition and sometimes that is habit forming and therefore it's difficult for um, complete resolution even if you've got adequate uh, hormone levels I've kind of said already that most frequently side effects are due to the progestogen and in those women then a long cycle regime is probably the better option. Um, maybe she's not using her treatment or maybe her patches are coming off. So with patches they need to be completely dry when they apply them. They should not put patches on when they come out the bath of the shower because we tend to sweat um, at times like that. Uh, it'd be better actually to put your patch on before uh, you went into the bath of the shower. Um, and it may be that she's only getting 10% of what she swallows and therefore changing the delivery route is the best option. Side effects can be estrogenic or progestogenic. As you can see there, there is a huge similarity between those. The, the one thing which I think is exclusively progestogenic tends to be PMT, uh, PMT, premenstrual tension like symptoms although to be absolutely honest women who have bad like pmdd premenstrual dysphoric disorder are sometimes sensitive to estrogen as well um, and as we'll see in the contraception talk sex steroid hormones all look very similar and they do interact with each other's receptors so there is a huge amount of overlap in those um, potential side effects so basically, in the first three months, if women are experiencing side effects, depending on how severe they are, I would be quite reassuring about them settling down, um, but maybe thinking about reducing hormone doses to reduce side effects or changing delivery route. So there are some prescribable alternatives to HRT. In my experience, clonidine is, is pretty useless and actually it's quite a nasty drug and I, I very, very rarely use it. I only would I would only use it in women who were unable to take hormones, such as women with um, hormone-dependent breast cancer. Um, SSRIs do help with menopausal symptoms, but they're not first-line treatment. And if I was going to pick an antidepressant, I would probably pick mirtazapine, but it can cause weight gain. I think uh, gabapentin is also a very nasty drug to be using. I had a consultation with a woman quite recently who had... A hysterectomy for endometriosis. Um, she was then prescribed oestrogen only HRT because she didn't have a uterus, but she still had deposits of endometriosis and she developed um, a nasty endometrioma. She had further surgery and then she was told she could never have HRT, which actually wasn't true. Uh, so she was being treated with huge doses of gabapentin like 1800 milligrams daily she was zonked most of the time um, and we've now transferred her to Everell Conti so those women need both hormones because they need the progestogen to protect any potential deposits of endometrium and her quality of life's massively improved so I'd like to finish off just to talk very briefly about breast cancer because I still find it really quite confusing myself these slides are courtesy of Joe Marsden who is a British Menopause Society Council member, colleague of mine. She's a retired breast surgeon. Um, she also wrote a very helpful consensus, state, consensus statement, which is on the BMS website, which I think you have to be a member to access. So I will make put that into PDF format and send that to Dan. It's helpful for counselling patients. So what we have here are the findings from the collaborative group on hormonal factors in breast cancer, which was published in The Lancet last November and resulted in an MHRA warning to GPs about the breast cancer risk with HRT. But actually, it was exactly what we knew already. And the long term follow up from the Women's Health Initiative study, that was the study that did all the damage in 2002, has been relatively reassuring. So I'm not going to go through these slides in detail, but basically estrogen only HRT has little impact on breast cancer risk or mortality. And in all of these slides, although you see um, a small excess risk, just look at the number of women on the far right who are not diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, 
For oestrogen only treatment, there is no evidence of a dosage effect and vaginal oestrogen is okay. It's fine. Um, I see lots of women taking off vaginal oestrogen for no good reason. So like I said, the systemic absorption with Vagifem, which is the lowest dose preparation that we have, it has a lifelong license. The, the, the systemic absorption is next to nothing. Um, and so both women using vaginal oestrogen and unopposed oestrogen systemically can be reassured about their risk. We know there's an increase in the risk of breast cancer with continuous combined HRT. That is not news. Um, and as I said before, I think the focus really should shift to the women who are not affected by breast cancer. Um, the pattern of prescription, i.e. sequential or continuous progestogen, is probably more relevant than the actual progestogen. Um, although it would appear that progesterone-derived progestogens are associated with less risk. But as I said before, there just isn't the evidence to support that at present. So that's kind of what we think. Um, and I think actually the type of progestogen ultimately is a pre personal preference and choice is good, but we perhaps shouldn't be reassuring women that there's less uh, risk associated with um, progesterone-derived progestogens. So, as I said, it's not new. We know there's an increased risk with continuous, continuous combined HRT. Um, there is a duration-dependent increase in risk, but that has to be balanced against a reduction in other health issues which are depicted on the next slide. So, there is an overall reduction in mortality with women taking HRT. So, when you think about continuous combined HRT, because that provides better endometrial protection, that will reduce the risk of endometrial cancer. And endometrial cancer is increasing in prevalence because it's associated with obesity. And we're all um, in the midst of an obesity epidemic. So I think that's a very important message. And there's also reduction in colorectal cancer and cardiovascular mortality in the short term. And probably the most important thing I'm going to say to you is this evening is that lifestyle risk factors need to, to be communicated to patients. So whilst patients might be very anxious about using hormone replacement therapy, it doesn't appear that they're anxious about uh, the risks associated with being overweight or um, having excess amounts of alcohol. Um, and as you'll see in the next slide, actually, alcohol is a very significant risk factor with regards to, to breast cancer. So I've always thought that a menopause consultation was an ideal opportunity to um, provide holistic care, to talk about other things, to talk about um, lifestyle changes, Walking 150 minutes a week is very good exercise for women. Pilates is good for core stability. Yoga is good for flexibility. Probably recommending a reduction in alcohol in women who drink heavily. Um, but definitely supporting women to reduce their weight because actually that's a very, very significant uh, risk factor. So if we consider now... Um, managing vasomotor symptoms in women who have breast cancer. So this is a different um, different issue altogether. And it's really important. I now, I've, I, I've moved from Southport, which was a small service to Liverpool Women's, which is a huge service. And I see many more women who have very complicated medical histories, but they all deserve a discussion about lifestyle changes, about clothing. You can get special clothing that reduces um, hot flushes and sweats. And actually women are really good at um, finding each other, supporting each other. So that's all really good. Um, I'm slightly uncomfortable about recommending complementary therapies and I'm not comfortable recommending any herbal therapies because these are often just basically unregulated plant oestrogens. Occasionally in women who have breast cancer who are on tamoxifen, we do use HRT, but that would be in a very, very small number of women. And those would be women referred, I think, to a specialist menopause service. Um, if women are using aromatase inhibitors, then there's absolutely no logic to providing them with hormones because aromatase inhibitors are basically blocking conversion of all other hormones to, to estrogen to, to get rid of estrogen altogether. 
Um, so we've talked about that probably enough. Um, one way in which we can manage women with breast cancer, which is estrogen receptor positive, is to use a, a drug called Megase. Um, that can work very well. Um, and then I, I said we would talk a little bit about managing um, urogenital atrophy. Now, this is, partic is it's a particular problem in women who have had breast cancer. Um, and particularly those women who are using aromatase inhibitors who you would be less likely to use vaginal estrogen. I'm not saying never because sometimes we do, but it's not logical really when you're trying to get rid of estrogen. Um, so they can end up in really quite a mess. And, uh, and the breast, the problem with the you know, breast cancer units are fantastic, but their um, objective is to reduce the risk of breast cancer but they tend and they tend to be very focused on that whereas i think you know you need to look at the whole person and if the treatment that you receive means that you can no longer have sex and that's a big part of your life and a part of your relationship then that's not a particularly good outcome vaginal moisturizers are a little bit like treating the tip of the iceberg it doesn't actually treat the underlying problem uh, topical estrogen does but we also know that um, histology and architecture is influenced by testosterone locally so DHEA dehydroepiandrosterone which is marketed as intrarosa prasterone um, 6.5 milligrams delivered vaginally on a daily basis and that's converted by a process called intrachronology in the vaginal mucosa to estrogen and testosterone so that's a really um, good uh, potential way of managing urogenital atrophy because actually systemic absorption if you look at the clinical trials is, is virtually zero and dospemaphene I mentioned before it's spelt wrongly there it's with an F um, is ingested orally so great for ladies who are just not comfortable touching anything uh, in the urogenital region and it has a beneficial effect on the vaginal mucosa but it doesn't affect the endometrium or the breast tissue so that's that's a useful addition so just really summarizing the importance of a holistic consultation that can be done really well in pharmacy i think you just have to have the basic facts and maybe if i pull together this um what i'm thinking about as a sensible um kind of booklet for primary care clinicians to have at their fingertips so that they can actually provide um, good quality basic menopause care. Um, I don't think all women should have HRT at all, but I think all women should be provided with the right information and they make their informed decision based on that information so that, you know, in 10 years, if the woman who has decided she won't have HRT has osteoporosis, well, you've given her all that information and it was her choice and you can't make her take that. So um, these are just some useful resources. I don't really know that it's the platform for discussion, but I'm happy for you to send questions to Dan and I'll answer them. I'm very happy actually if you want advice, if you contact me by email or telephone, that's fine. Um, I'm going to give you just like a couple of minutes break while I change the slides over. So um, this is probably just going to take half an hour. Um, I have specifically chosen to talk about the combined hormonal contraception guidelines because I think it's more relevant to you in pharmacy. Um, so I'm going to focus on short acting, which is basically uh, pills. Um, and actually when you look at patient choice women like taking the pill and so although we are encouraging women to think about long-acting reversible contraception i think we have to accept that about 59 percent of women who access sexual and reproductive health services are um, using a user dependent method that would be pills or condoms so 42 percent pills 14 percent condoms and 41 percent are using a long acting reversible method they're fit and forget and they take the user out of the equation so you can see why failure rates are better with the long acting methods and of all of the choices 16 percent of women are using implants nine percent intrauterine systems seven percent a copper iud and 9% injectables. And actually, it's interesting with the whole um, pandemic issue, obviously it's more difficult for women to, to access 
the LARC methods because they need a face-to-face -face appointment. So I don't know whether you're experiencing more women attending community pharmacy for advice. Uh, and I hope this will be useful. So I always go back to the menstrual cycle when I'm talking about contraception, because I think if you understand the process of conception, then it's so much easier to understand the mode of action of the different hormonal contraceptive choices. So we have the hypothalamus releasing GnRH stimulates the anterior pituitary, which releases follicle stimulating hormone says exactly what it does stimulates the primordial follicles in the ovary and there are lots of those and they start to grow and they secrete estrogen which is the dominant hormone in the first half of the cycle and usually one of those uh, primordial follicles will become the dominant follicle so that's destined to produce an egg occasionally you get more than one you get twins or triplets but usually it's one um, and the oestrogen level will reach a critical point um, which will result in a negative feedback so you stop getting stimulation of the follicles but you will also get a positive feedback that is the um, stimulus for the LH uh, surge and that would be better called the ovulating surge. It peaks 24 hours before ovulation occurs and that 24 hours is the time during which a woman is at risk of pregnancy. Once the the egg is released you get the corpus luteum and that produces progesterone which is the dominant hormone in the second half of the cycle and that has um, an inherent lifespan of 14 days so you can backtrack to when a woman ovulated by subtracting 14 days from the first day of her menstrual period so to summarize there there are lots of things going on there's the timing uh, there is the effect of those hormones on the cervical mucus. So estrogen makes the cervical mucus slippery, egg whitey, that's basic fertile mucus, and that promotes the passage of sperm. Uh, and progesterone makes it thick and turgid and like a plug, and it prevents sperm penetrating through uh, the cervical canal. And sperm will die very quickly in the acid environment in the vagina. Um, so if fertilization does not occur, um, then you don't get HCG, which I call hey, keep going hormone, and the um, corpus luteum dies and the endometrium will slough off as a period. So you've got the timing, you've got the cervical mucus, and the final thing, if you're looking at natural family planning, is that progesterone is mildly thermogenic so you will get a small but sustained rise in body temperature once a woman starts to produce progesterone from the corpus luteum so all of those things can be used to inform uh, natural family planning which I'm not an advocate of however um, I was on a radio program talking about emergency contraception which I think is a total minefield. I know you probably prescribe or you probably provide emergency hormonal contraception, but my personal opinion after many, many years is that it is probably not very effective. So most of the women that present are not going to get pregnant anyway. And the ones who are at high risk, i.e. they're, they're on day 13, it doesn't matter what you give them very small effect what you give them but basically if you give levonorgestrel once the LH surge has started it's no better than placebo and LA1 uloprostolacity it's a little bit better but it's not perfect and the only thing really that would make a difference to these women is a copper IUD anyway the long and the short of the radio program was that I found myself recommending natural cycles which I couldn't really believe I was doing but it's better than nothing and it's better than the most popular method of contraception in Liverpool which is withdrawal so natural cycles takes into account all of the things that I was talking about so women take their temperature every single morning before they do anything at all they put it into a nifty little app they might um, use the addition of um, little urine sticks which check their LH level and then this clever little computer tells them whether they can have sex and not be at risk or whether they can't. So apparently in um, educated women who understand the menstrual cycle, this is as effective or has a similar effectiveness rate as the combined pill. It's there as a choice. Uh, and I included it in this presentation because I think with the current unplanned pregnancy rates in this country, we really should be um, considering all available options. 
So if we move on to um, how our different hormonal methods work, we've got uh, progestogens, which, as I said, are the synthetic hormone, and they affect the LH peak, the process of ovulation. So if you don't ovulate, you're not going to get pregnant. And they also thicken cervical mucus. They prevent sperm penetration in exactly the same way as the naturally occurring hormone. And estrogen will increase... Um, the sensitivity of the progesterone receptors within the endometrial cavity and they're great for cycle control and that's why women who use combined pills generally speaking are happier because they have predictable bleeding or as you'll see later in this presentation they have the option to avoid bleeding which you know in my opinion there is nothing good about bleeding so you may as well avoid it if there's a good way of doing it um and they also affect the um, development of the dominant follicle. So again, they're influencing that process of, of ovulation. So if anybody's ever heard me talk before, I have got quite a visual memory, if I, a visual way of thinking. If somebody came in for a contraceptive consultation, that's what I see in my head. Um, and somebody might come in and ask for the pill, but that's just their way of asking what's on offer. Um, so I think it's important to remember all of the combined hormonal contraceptive choices. That's pills, patches, the vaginal ring. Think about the progestogen-only choices. That's the progestogen-only pill. And we virtually exclusively use desogestrel pills because of the 12-hour window. Um, also, they inhibit ovulation, unlike the older progestogen-only pills. And by the time women have been taking them for 12 months, which I know is a long time, most women um, are bleed-free. Um, then we have injectables, and we have choices. So we have Depo-Provera and also now Cyanopress, which is a more bioavailable molecule. It's self-administered or has the potential to be self-administered. So actually, in the current pandemic it's a really really good option then we've got next one on it's the only implant and with intrauterine systems there are now four so morena has been around since 1994 uh jades i don't know when jades was was first launched i think it was about 2012 more recently kylina so jades is the device with the smallest amount of levonorgestrel they've all got levonorgestrel it's got 13.5 milligrams compared with 52 in marina and also leave assert has 52 milligrams and these are all branded products they all have a massive beneficial effect on uh, bleeding they're incredibly reliable methods of contraception but contraception but if you look at the most reliable method it is uh, an implant um, and then we've touched briefly on natural family planning withdrawal <laughs> i don't like to miss that out um, and then barrier methods copper ieds are a very effective method of contraception uh, cop the copper is poisonous to sperm and it changes the the endometrium there's a white cell infiltrate which will influence um implantation so one of the reasons why they're particularly good for emer emergency contraception is they affect both fertilization and implantation and sterilization really should be reserved for couples um, or people who who are absolutely 100 percent sure that their family is complete so i've said this already um, earlier on but basically any method which takes the user out of the equation takes away the differential between perfect user failure rates and typical user failure rates. So we know that the pill is a very effective method of contraception if it's taken uh, reliably, but in real life, it's got a 9% failure rate because people forget to take it. Um, and as you'll see later on, if we use uh, tailored pill taking, so we reduce the hormone free interval, that will reduce that margin for error. So this is an important slide because it makes the point that if you have an agenda and it's not the patient's agenda and you decide what she's going to use for contraception and it's not what she wants, she's not going to continue with the method. So even although I'm telling you that Nexplanon is the most effective method of contraception that we have available if we provide that to a woman who doesn't really want it and she finds that she's unfortunate enough to be one of the women who's going to bleed every day, you can bet your bottom dollar she will have that implant removed within the first few months and therefore actually that's not cost-effective contraception. I think it's really important with implants that we 
uh, explain to women that we cannot predict what bleeding pattern she, she will experience. On average, we know that women have less bleeding with implants, but there's no pattern. It inhibits ovulation. The menstrual cycle goes. If she's lucky, she gets nothing. If she's unlucky, she gets continual bleeding. But the other really important thing to say is if that's you, then we can provide you with treatment we can give you the pill on top of your implant that's perfectly okay and it'll stop you bleeding sometimes use the injection on top of the implant and women may only require one injection every year uh, or even less frequently to resolve the problem so i go back um to the uk medical eligibility criteria which was last updated in 2016 it is essential to contraceptive consultations it's easily accessible. You can bring it up on your phone, uh, on your computer, and you can ensure if you do that, that you're not going to make a mistake, that you're not going to provide a woman with a method of contraception, which is potentially um, dangerous to her. So the UK medical eligibility criteria is not about efficacy. It's about safety. And it doesn't talk about non-contraceptive benefits or efficacy and it doesn't replace clinical judgment um, and the new combined hormonal contraception guideline well it was new last january so still relatively new does address contraception for its non-contraceptive benefits um, the fsrh ran a really good webinar um, for diplomats and members and fellows uh, they also provided summary sheets which again i can download and, and provide to dan for you um, and I'm hoping just to really cover the important points of that um, document in this presentation. I think it's really important to say to you that the um, FS FSRH, the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health, have changed the diploma and it's now available to pharmacists. So I think that's excellent, fantastic. I think if you're going to be providing contraceptive choices, then it's a really good way of ensuring that your knowledge is up to date and you're backed by that body should something go wrong. So um, age alone is not a contraindication to any method. So you might have a 48 year old woman who biologically could be 35. You might have another 48 year old woman who looks about 65. And so I think you have to take all of the um, health issues in the individual in front of you into consideration. Um, obviously you wouldn't use the combined pill in somebody over 35 who was smoking heavily, but if she's not smoking and she's fit as a fiddle, um, then actually there are huge benefits to using combined pills in women in their 40s because they will also manage symptoms of the of the perimenopause. So um, the UK MEC supports the use of combined hormonal contraception up to the age of 50. And women should use contraception until 55. That's my preference i don't like as i said before measuring fsh levels unnecessarily it's easier just to continue with contraception until the woman's 55 because if she's on a combined pill and you want to measure an fsh level you're going to have to stop that and then she's potentially at risk of pregnancy having said that women become less fertile as they get older but the eldest woman I saw who was pregnant was 51 and it was awful it was much more awful than it was for a teenager getting pregnant because she never thought for a minute that was going to happen it, it wasn't something she'd even considered and, and it really was very traumatic for her she ended up having an ectopic pregnancy but the whole thing was just a nightmare um, so I talked about this slide in the previous presentation, but you can see that all of those sex steroid hormones have a kind of chicken wire appearance I have a very simplistic way of looking at things, but I think they do all look very similar, but they all have very subtle differences. So most um, of our combined hormonal choices contain ethanol, estradiol. We do have one pill with um, estradiol valerate, that's Clara. And Clara has um, an additional license for women with heavy menstrual bleeding who require contraception, who have no anatomical abnormality. So it's got a very specific license and it's not a first line pill, but it does result in about an 88% reduction in median menstrual blood loss, very similar to Mirena, and is very, very helpful in women who are in the menopause transition, if particularly if they have heavy periods and they're not eligible for um, Mirena. And then, as you see, 
Here, the various progestogens, um, again, have a very similar structure, but they all have a very slightly different effect on the sex steroid receptors. Um, so just to go back to explaining things in an easy to understand manner, sex steroid hormones, for example, estradiol and progesterone, the naturally occurring hormones will interact with the receptor like a key in a lock. And these synthetic hormones will also interact with those receptors, but the fit is not exact and they will interact with other receptors. So, for example, um, nor norethindrone is the same as norethistrone, but that interacts with the estrogen receptor. It stimulates it. So it has an estrogenic effect. And um, if you have a patient, for example, who's prescribed uh, five milligrams of norethistrone to take three times a day, as a lifestyle drug to go on holiday to stop bleeding and she's overweight so body mass index 35 40 even goes on a long haul flight well she wouldn't at the moment but she might do in the future then she's at a significantly increased risk of vte because that's similar to prescribing a 20 microgram pill so it's just worth knowing uh, about that and also gestadine and desogestrel are more estrogenic which is the reason why in the 1995 pill scare those pills were associated with a slightly higher risk of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary emboli my feeling about different progestogens is there is a very subtle difference between them if you consider the risk of venous thromboembolism but the much more significant risk is the individual so I would think <laughs> it's better for you to concentrate on dangerous women rather than dangerous pills and, and that way you will be much less likely um, to run into difficulties. So the pill was first um, developed, made available in the 1960s. It revolutionized women's lives. They couldn't believe their luck and they tolerated unbearable side effects. So, you know, they had high doses of estrogen, which caused breast tenderness, nausea, headaches. They felt probably horrendous. And in order to reassure them, assure them that they weren't pregnant, because all of those could be signs, uh, symptoms of pregnancy, um, those pills were associated with a seven day hormone free interval seven day break it took seven days for the hormone levels to come down and a withdrawal bleed to occur and in addition to as as time's gone on we've ha had pills with a much more reduced dose of estrogen and and a much better tolerated progestogens but um, we've kept the same regimes and so if you've got a woman who's on a 20 microgram pill who takes it for 21 days and then has a seven day break there is a risk of spontaneous ovulation so I think as time's moved on we've understood that actually have it, having a seven day break is not necessary the pill was developed like that in the 60s to simulate normality because there was a hope that the Catholic Church would accept it which it didn't but we kind of got stuck uh, with something that induced a monthly bleed to simulate normality so we've moved we're moving on from that you don't need to bleed on the combined pill um and we will cover i'm going to cover tailored pill taking in more detail a little bit later on so the new guideline highlights as i said the non-contraceptive benefits associated with combined hormonal contraception and this slide just summarizes the benefits side effects and risks um and the cardiovascular risks increase with age and obesity. Uh, and additional risk factors include things like migraine, arrhythmias, hyperlipidemia. As I said before, the VTE risk is increased in association with combined hormonal contraception, but the absolute risk remains very small. So, you know, if you think about your background risk of VTE for all women is about 4.5 for every 10,000 women. If you take the pill, it doubles. So it's nine for every 10,000 women. So it's still low. Um, if your body mass index is over 30, I think your risk is up to about 23 in every 10,000. So it's a significant increase in risk. But your risk in pregnancy is, is much higher than that, about 29 for every 10,000 women. So if we think about desirable effects, preventing pregnancy, including ectopic pregnancy, reducing bleeding, reducing gynecological cancers. Nobody talks about that. Everybody talks about breast cancer and cancer of the cervix. 
Um, I have an interest in premenstrual dysphoric disorder and the pill can be used to treat that, but we use a very specific combination of, a tw of 20 micrograms of ethanol estradiol with drosperinone three milligrams in a 24 four regime. And we often tell women to omit the four placebo pills. Uh, we can use um, anti-androgenic progestogens to um, treat women who've got acne. So if you've got somebody in front of you who's sexually active and she's got acne, she's much more likely to take her pill properly if she has that additional beneficial effect. Um, so there is a, also a reduced risk of colorectal cancer, cancer overall and PID, um, pelvic inflammatory disease. And then we have the undesirable effects, which include VTE, which we've talked about at length, arterial thromboembolism. And so the baseline assessment here is really important, measuring blood pressure, and me measuring blood pressure and body mass index. That will reduce inappropriate prescribing of combined hormonal contraception to women who might potentially be at risk. And I don't think we should underplay transient um, adverse effects. They might seem like nothing to worry about to us. And as I said before, women did used to tolerate them better than they do now. But these things might make the difference between your patient continuing or just stopping her pill. And that's the problem with the pill. She can just stop it. She doesn't need you to remove um, the device as she would as if it was an implant or, um, or, or an intrauterine method of contraception. So the guideline makes the point that there is no need for thrombophilia screening, screening for hyperlipidemia, diabetes, liver function tests routinely before women are commenced on pills. And all this thing, all those, that information in that document is important in the current climate. So with regards to cancer, the risk of developing, as I said, both uterine and ovarian cancer in women using combined pills is significantly reduced and the same with patches and vaginal, the vaginal ring. We know that cancer of the cervix is caused by high risk HPV and the pill is a cofactor, but it will not cause cancer of the cervix on its own. Uh, and therefore it's not responsible for the slight increase in cancer of the cervix seen on this slide. And when we look at breast cancer, at worst, studies have shown a small effect of combined pills on incidence, but any effect will gradually decline uh, over time following cessation of the method. So the document, so the document summarizes that situation by saying that the breast cancer risk associated with combined hormonal contraception, CHC, is 1.2, and the increase in risk associated with um, cancer of the cervix is is two, two times, so it's doubled. Um, and that guideline advises informing women of the risk, the increased risk with um, CHC of developing breast or cervical cancer. Now, personally, I feel that needs to be done very carefully. And, you know, it's a battle to get women to engage with contraception and starting to talk about cancer is not always the best way of doing that so i i appreciate what the document says i want you to know what the document says but i also want you to know um, that that information needs to be communicated very carefully so i know th there's questions here and it's not really the uh, it's not really easy to ask questions on a webinar like this but a first line combined pill what would you recommend the recommendation is that we use um, pills which contain levonorgestrel or norethisterone. Um, and how would you recommend that the woman in front of you takes her pill? Well, I'm going to cover that in the next few slides. We will talk about um, different uh, regimes. So we've got the kind of classical 21 days with active pills and seven days of placebo or a seven day hormone free interval, seven day break. Or uh, the patient could take the pill for 21 days with a four day break or she can run three packs together. Now, all this is out of product license, but it's recommended by FSRH and it's much better. So that's called tricycling. We've been doing it since 1970. Um, it just doesn't have the license, but it's perfectly safe. Um, if she's going to use a tailored regimen, she should have taken 21 pills before she starts doing that. So the other thing which is important, I think, about providing women with contracep contraception is um, making sure you take the opportunity to kind of myth bust a little bit. So 
Being on the pill does not have any ongoing effect on your future fertility um, and it doesn't make you fat. Uh, eating too much makes, uh, makes you fat and women don't really like to hear that. Uh, so I think to be fair though, some women are very sensitive, sex steroid hormones are an appetite stimulant. So I suppose it is possible um, that women might gain weight in association with eating more, but all that probably needs to be explained so that she doesn't just discontinue her pill and then become pregnant. So this is just a little, um, a little uh, vignette. Lizzie's 28, she's got acne. She's taking a pill uh, containing 30 micrograms of ethanol, estradiol, and drosperinone, three milligrams. I do not remember, the, I know what that pill is, but I don't uh, call it by its name because the market's being flooded by branded generic equivalents and they've all got really bizarre names. So I think it's really important that clinicians, whoever they happen to be, who are providing contraception, understand what's in the pills. She's getting headaches in the hormone-free interval. That's a common hormone withdrawal uh, side, effects, side effect. So what should she do? Should she change to a pill with a similar um, combination, but a lower dose of estrogen? Because she's on an anti-androgenic progestogen. Uh, so that's a progestogen which blocks the androgen receptor and it will be really good for her acne. So changing uh, to the similar combination but with a lower dose of estrogen is an option because the withdrawal effect when she has her interval will be less obvious. Should she admit the hormone-free interval? Well, definitely that's an option. She might decide that she'll reduce it to four days. That's also an option. So basically the answer to that question, she can do any of those things. And our job is to reassure her that doing any of those things is um, absolutely acceptable and also to give her some clear information to support tailored pill taking. And that's available from the faculty website. So these are the different tailored pill taking options. I'm not going to run through those um, individually, but you can look at those later on. And, and how she takes the pill really is up to her. Some women will get breakthrough bleeding. So basically, if you're going to take the pill continuously with no break, what happens is some women will get away with that completely. And they're really, really lucky. They never have to take a break or sometimes they will start to get breakthrough bleeding. And they should continue to monitor that for three days because it might go away on its own. But if it doesn't, they can take a four day a four day hormone free interval uh, and they will normally have a withdrawal bleed and that will normally settle down when they recommence their pill and that might happen twice a year three times a year four times a year that tends to, to, to work in a pattern for an individual woman so i want to talk about hormonal contraception in women who have epilepsy and just ask you to think about which of the following choices that you see here will provide reliable contraception in, woman, in a woman using an enzyme-inducing drug? So that's a drug like carbamazepine, the combined pill, the implant, or an intrauterine system. So important message from this slide is there are only two options from a contraception point of view which provide reliable contraception in women using an enzyme inducing drug um, and that includes any of the intrauterine choices or injectable contraception so basically the combined pill and the implant are not going to provide her with reliable contraception and those women slip through the net all the time um, so the UK MEC covers epilepsy from a safety point of view so from a safety point of view Epileptic women on medication can have access to any contraceptive method, but it's not the method is not necessarily going to be efficacious. So, as I said at the beginning, the UK MEC um, is about safety, not efficacy. And you just have to remember that. Uh, the Medscape drug interaction checker is is absolutely. Um, fantastic it's easy to use uh, and it will show you if there's an interaction so lamotrigine is a is, is a kind of complicated uh, anti-epileptic medication in that the issue is not with the contraceptive method becoming less effective it's with the issues around the hormone free interval so the um, level of lamotrigine is influenced by the hormonal contraceptive and women will often have their dose increased to achieve good 
seizure control and therefore if they withdraw the hormones then the level of lamotrigine can cause toxicity uh, and that can be a problem but if the woman is on a method which is provided continually like an implant then there is no issue. Um, I think it's just worth mentioning antibiotics which are not enzyme inducing there is no issue with those um, and in women taking the combined pill. So years ago, we used to say that women were at an increased risk of an unplanned pregnancy. That's not the case. It is the case with enzyme-inducing antibiotics, but they're not commonly used. Um, Eulopristal acetate, which, as you know, is provided for emergency contraception, competes um, for the uh, progesterone receptor. So it's a selective progesterone receptor modulator. And women who have been provided with Ella one should have five days before they're commenced on hormonal contraception. So that's important to know. The other thing which can affect um, systemic levels of hormones are vomiting and diarrhea. So that's an important part of your history. Um, and that can still affect contraceptive efficacy. So if you've got somebody who, for example, has got Crohn's, Crohn's disease and has real issues with diarrhea, then you know, you'd be better using a drug which is absorbed straight into the systemic circulation and doesn't go through the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, and that's just showing uh, the effect of carbamazepine on a combined pill. It's microgynon therapy, but there are lots of other uh, pills with that combination of hormones now. So, in my uh, little classification, I've got SARCs, that's short-acting reliable contraception, MARCs, medium-acting reliable contraception, uh, LARCs, which we know are long-acting reliable contraception, and NARCs, which are things like withdrawal. But, but the medium-acting methods, so that's the patch and the vaginal ring, are really just like the pill through the skin or through the vagina. And they work well. There's some anxiety about um, Evra, which is the only patch, having a slightly higher failure rate in women who've got a body mass index over 90. Um, I don't know whether that's the case, um, but you know it's as well to know that that's in the guideline. Um, Nuvering, so, so Evra is changed weekly, so you go patch, 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 and then the recommendation at the launch was that you have a patch-free week, but you don't have to do that, so you could theoretically go patch, 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 uh, patch, 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 um, but again, that's out of product license, and with Nuva Ring, one ring is inserted normally for three weeks and then removed for a week, but again, you can leave it in for four weeks, um, and actually contraceptive efficacy is not affected, and it can still come out for a week, but there's something to be said for one Nuva ring in, left in four weeks, removed another one, put straight back in. Nuva ring is culturally not uh, acceptable, I don't think, in this in this country. Uh, in Europe, in Spain, for example, it's the market leader for contraception. It's discreet. Um, there is a risk of expulsion, uh, particularly in women who have any element of urogenital prolapse. Um, but it's a great choice. Um, it causes a very slight increase in vaginal discharge, which is great for women in the in, in their forties. But um, as I say, it's not really uh, a particularly popular method in this country. So we had uh, this review of consultation methodology at the launch of the guideline in January two thousand and nineteen, which is really interesting considering the situation that we're in now. Um, it, you know. In, a, in, in the pandemic, having the ability to do consultations online is, is really helpful. Um, and the guideline was suggesting that women could fill out a questionnaire um, to check for ongoing eligibility. And I would agree that that's perfectly feasible. And the questions that I ask women are about their, their medication to make sure that they're not on any enzyme inducing drugs, to make sure that they haven't developed migraine with aura, which would absolutely contraindicate uh, the combined pill, patch and vaginal ring, that they haven't had a first degree relative under the age of 45 who's had a, a DVT or a pulmonary embolus. So you review their medical history, including their drug history, check their blood pressure and their BMI. And lots of women now will have their own blood pressure monitors and they'll be able to give you their BMI. And, and, and um, hormonal contraception is available online now. The Royal uh, provides the pill 
um, for patients in Liverpool. And I think if you're outside of that catchment area, you pay for it, but women are actually willing to pay for it. So that's an interesting advance. Um, there's no reason why women cannot be provided with a 12 month supply, even new users if there's no contraindications. I mean, historically, we used to give women a three month supply and then see them back. But I think we have to adapt to the situation that we're in at the moment. So um, take home messages really are about um, ensuring safe prescribing by adhering to the UK MEC, by keeping up to date with guidelines and all of the FSRH guidelines are, are freely available. Um, thinking about contraceptive choice, uh, supporting women to make the right choice, talking about non-contraceptive benefits because our patient population really get battered with the negative stuff, um, making sure you uh, explain about tailored pill taking, think about the more complex women, are, are we making sure that we are giving her something uh, that is not just safe but effective because at the end of the day if you're providing contraception and it's not affected because of our other medication, then you're, you're only doing a little bit of the job. Um, and I think we should be thinking about reducing uh, unnecessary consultation times, particularly in the current climate. And I know there's a big drive in some CCGs to provide a month of treatment. I don't think that necessarily applies to contraception that would normally be provided three months at a time because of the packaging but for women on hrt being given a month of hrt at a time drives them absolutely loopy um, and i think we need to kind of review that that behavior because it's just not helpful to the patient e e even if there is some justification and i do appreciate actually that there are wa wasted medications but there are also women who are trying to work and trying to get an appointment at the doctor is a full-time job so you know, again, that promotes the role of a pharmacist, doesn't it? So lots of information. Um, I think we're probably all overloaded with information. So I think we'll, we'll maybe leave questions. But if you do have any questions, then direct them to Dan, who will direct them to me.